Hi everyone, thanks so much for coming out today. My name's Taylor and I'm the programs coordinator here at CAM. Regarding is a program that has been designed to use exhibitions as a catalyst for further cultural inquiry. Contemporary artists often draw on or are informed by a variety of fields while making their work. And this means that there's a wide range of interdisciplinary access points in contemporary art and the museum. CAM partners with a wide range of experts to provide our audiences with this intellectual inquiry. Past topics for the Regarding series have included the post-internet, barbershops, robotics, debtor's prison, the queer gaze, psychofiguration, and this fall we're going to be exploring Bosnian narratives, but today we're here to explore the symbol of our great city, the Gateway Arch. The format today, as you can see, is going to involve more of a moderated discussion led by CAM's own communications specialist, Eddie Silva, um, but there's going to be time for Q&A at the end, and I just want to introduce our other speakers. So we have Rhonda Shear, who is the Chief of Museum Services and Interpretation of the National Park Service at the Jefferson National Expansion Memorial here in St. Louis. She's been an educator for over 30 years with 20 years of experience in the classroom and 10 years within the National Park Service, having served at Mount Rushmore, Independence National Historical Park in Philadelphia, and Valley Forge National Historical Park. And Michael Allen founded the Preservation Research Office in 2009, where he's presently the director and architectural historian. Allen holds an appointment as University College Coordinator and Lecturer in the American Cultural Studies Program at Washington University in St. Louis, and is also a board member at the National Building Arts Center and Modern STL. So I'm going to let Eddie take it away. Thanks so much. Thanks, Taylor. And I want to thank you all for coming. Um, you can't do a show called Urban Planning without, in St. Louis without having something about the Gateway Arch. Um, I think that the Gateway Arch offers us many, many ideas, concepts, themes, all around ideas of urbanity, urban planning, um, the relationship between a great monument and the city itself. Um, because, I, because I'm a writer, I just, it helps me to start with something that I've actually written. So <laughs> I'm going to read you, uh, this is from a piece that was published in the St. Louis Magazine a number of years ago. Um, and this is just, a, this is just a, a grounding place to think about, to think about the arch. Even as the arch is bound to earth, it soars. It resists gravity. Anchored by tons of concrete foundation, it never the, nonetheless conveys lightness. It guides the eye skyward. The technological achievement of its time, eclipsed only by the space program, it is paradoxically an ancient form. Thomas Jefferson, our only architect president, would have recognized the symbolism, the arch, a form Jefferson himself replicated at Monticello and the University of Virginia, represents the for formal purity inherent in the classical mind. Jefferson revered nature, the sublime order and symmetry and power found there. In his home state, he admired a natural, natural sandstone bridge honed by time and wind and water he undoubtedly would have recognized its likeness in the man-made structure by the banks of the Mississippi, a single line of glistening steel extracted from nature, bridging earth and sky. It is of the city, yet separate, an ideal to be realized. There, now I've read that and I feel calmer now. <laughs> <laughs> a quick question. How many of you are here from, from St. Louis? And how many of you have been to the Arch? And when is the, just kind of, and what is the most, how, how recently have you been there? Just shout out some. Last week. <laughs> Fantastic. Pardon? Oh, just there. <laughs> well, I'm curious how many have been up in it. Can we? Really? Next, next trick question. Um, it, it is the, the official name of the Gateway Arch is the Jefferson, Jefferson National Expansion Memorial. Great. And it is a memorial to what? Jefferson. 
westward expansion. Okay, great. <laughs> the arch has many, many narratives, and we're going to try and touch on as many of them as we possibly can. Um, I think that um, Rhonda and I were just talking about the, one of the early inspirations for the, for the arch and the character of, of Luther Eli Smith. Do you all know him? Okay. Luther Eli Smith, there's actually a park that's part of the National Expansion Memorial that is called Luther Eli Smith Park, is it not? And it is Luther Eli Smith who one, one day was coming from the, um, the naming of um, the, the, George, the, the, the George Rogers Clark Memorial in Indiana. Yes, in Vincennes, Indiana. He was coming back from that. He was part of the the Federal Commission that created that. that. Mm -hmm. And then he was coming back on the train and he gets to St. Louis and he looks and he looks at well, what does he see when he gets to St. Louis? This is the late 1920s, early 1930s. This is for Ethan. Oh, <laughs> I heard about. someone in the audience say slums. Yeah, he saw the uh, decrepit and derelict area of the, ri the Mississippi River front, which he said, hmm, that's not a very welcoming, inspirational urban site for our out-of-town people or our residents coming home. Wouldn't it be nice to have some sort of a St. Louis monument or memorial or urban park to be revitalizing the city and making a really nice um, experience for people entering and seeing something beautiful and ins inspirational rather than old uh, warehouses and buildings that look like they might be ready to um, be torn down. Right. But he probably hadn't been inside of the artist loft or the Cafe Bohemia that were found on Commercial Alley, sort of the Cherokee Street of its time. Maybe he didn't have faith in the slow and careful development, building by building, loft by loft. He looked at the world much differently than the pioneers who were already dwelling down there before the clearance began. Yes. That is one of the, th that's what, in, t in terms of urban planning, the idea of, of, of the clearances that Michael just brought up is, 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 is a part of the Gateway Arches history as well. Um, we have two views of what was there. There was Luther Eli Smith's view, which is what he saw, what, what he saw was a derelict waterfront. Um, what has come to pass in recent years, uh, and Michael, you can perhaps dip into this some more, is what was, what was the life of this area that then became not until 1930s, 1939, when this area was totally cleared? Mm-hmm. A sense of what was there. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, there were again conflicting views of what was there. To Smith and downtown real estate interests, there was a cancer, this blot of buildings that was, you know, one real estate exchange member said in the 1930s, you know, f the rents of, are so low closer to the waterfront, it's threatening the real estate values in the core of downtown where they were all invested in these office buildings. And they thought, clearance would increase profitability of their real estate. To the pioneers, they were attracted to what pioneers in cities are often attracted to, so-called pioneers. We can talk about that phrase later, but um, cheap rent, affordable space, indelible architectural character. Uh, to architectural historians, including some who worked for the Park Service, um, there was one of America's greatest assemblages of early 19th century commercial architecture. So profoundly significant that uh, Siegfried Gideon, sort of the dean of architectural history in the 1930s, made an impassioned plea to St. Louis to stop this project and at least rescue some of the great cast iron warehouses of its riverfront. He came to St. Louis in 1939. He wrote about this in his book, Space, Time, and Architecture, which used to be the foundational architectural history text across the country in schools of architecture. Um, to elected officials, though, it was an area that put St. Louis in a league of declining places rather than growing places. They perhaps were unaware that the last census that recorded more than a doubling of St. Louis's population was 1860. In fact, the city had been declining since before the Civil War, if you look at it that way. Go ahead. Let's go ahead.
Yeah, mm -hmm. there were people. There, in the Depression, the riverfront was popular for the so-called Hooverville, temporary housing up and down the riverfront. Uh, also houseboat uh, occupation. There were um, people like W.C. Handy lived on the riverfront. Joe Jones, the artist, lived on the riverfront. Um, some attracted because they were penniless, but others because they thought it was a, a sort of a forgotten place in St. Louis that could be reinvented as a refuge for creativity. Um, and there were loft dwellers living in lofts. Um, people here probably don't know the names Alice Martin and Harry Turner, but they were sort of uh, principals in St. Louis's bohemian counterculture in the 1930s. Turner published a uh, literary journal called Much Ado. Alice Martin was a uh, uh, dramaturge and um, a choreographer, and they lived on Commercial Alley in probably the first loft apartment in St. Louis. They were evicted for this project. And our historian Bob Moore um, has done research and determined there, are, uh, there were about 170 individuals that lived there that needed to relocate because of the project. Um, I was ruffling around, rustling around looking for a quote I wanted to read that someone else had written, not me, but um, Thomas Jefferson. And I'll just kind of um, do the best I can with it and share it with you later ver verbatim if you're interested. But one of the things that I liked about what he said is that preserving and studying history helps us be better judges of men and deeds. And so we always, in our line of work, and our craft, try to do the very best we can to understand history from current knowledge and from the most recent research and the kinds of things that we've uncovered as historians and scholars. And so looking back on it, we are quite sure that there are things that the National Park Service would have done differently, perhaps managed differently. Um, one of the things that I admired about the project when you study the, the history is um, people like Charles Peterson, who was a landscape architect, was quite intent on his assignment here to manage this demolition project to preserve as much as he could. And um, the successful step that he almost uh, managed was to have a museum of architecture. And they actually preserved one large warehouse in the riverfront area to store all of the wonderful cast iron facades and a lot of the artifacts um, and architectural details from the various buildings with the idea to support um, Errol Saarinen's vision of a historical museum and also a museum of architecture. And wouldn't that be wonderful to have those um, examples of the architecture preserved for future generations in a museum of some kind? Unfortunately, the idea filtered away for some reason under some sort of pressure, um, and it never happened, and they took out the pieces. They took out the, uh, the idea of the architectural museum. But one of the um, original buildings that was preserved, along with the old cathedral and um, the um, old courthouse, was the original rock house that was the um, original warehouse for fur trading down there on the riverfront as the oldest building in St. Louis. They actually renovated it and displayed it for many years, had to move it for the arch project, and so they dismantled it. And wouldn't you know, all those wonderful rocks are in storage in my office building, the basement <laughs> of the old courthouse, all numbered wow. and labeled to be rebuilt in our new museum the best that we can with additional rocks to create the at least two-sided structure to at least maintain that story of history and that particular historical building. So there are a lot of things that hi history has taught us that we would evaluate differently. We might make different decisions. There might have been more of a, um, an outcry to historic preservation uh, against the, um, the steady stream of enthusiasm for this new riverfront park. But yes, it did take down about um, 400 buildings, maybe 300 businesses. The mm -hmm. survey indicated that 256 of the businesses would relocate. And about 50 of the businesses said, we'll go out of business, we can't survive, and we can't relocate. Mm -hmm. So that's all part of the legacy of this urban um, legend of this city and what it's, what it's gone through. Mm -hmm. Great. And I want to jump in with, because um, I think the Jefferson quote is, is interesting, um, because there, there was sort of a generational and, and, and sort of philosophical divide in St. Louis at the time. Um, while inside of the Park Service and official quarters, there might not have been sort of a dissent. There was public opposition to this project in St. Louis that Tracy Campbell's written about in his book, The Gateway Arch, a biography, and counter sort of proposals coming from business leaders like uh, C.W. Godefroy, a cosmetics uh, 
executive, young, young man in his 30s at the time, he proposed a, what he called self-financing Jefferson National Expansion Memorial that would have been based on a Williamsburg model where selective buildings, it wouldn't have been a whole preservation project, but selective buildings would have been saved and they would have housed businesses and it would have been sort of a charming old school, old quarter, Charleston or New Orleans-like living environment. Um, and Alexander Wethano, another young uh, a business leader proposed saving again selective buildings along one street and allowing the memorial to proceed around that. And there, there are a couple examples like that where you see younger business leaders saying maybe the total clearance actually makes little sense, that maybe revitalizing these buildings could produce more economic yields than tearing everything down just to increase values on 7th and 8th streets where these building owners are so entrenched. Um, but they were shut out by the establishment that sort of pushed for this whole project. Um, and then, of course, one of the sad uh, sort of facts of this, and you know, every, everything spiritual has a profane side, right? The arch is sort of the election to raise the city funds in 1935 is still uh, hotly contested by uh, historians who've looked into what appears to be massive voter fraud for the city's bond issue to match the federal funds. This is something that the Washington Post editorialized in 1936 that St. Louis's uh, residents had in fact not voted for this. And the Post-Dispatch in 1935 called for a revote because of voter fraud. These are all facts that kind of haunt the, the history of the arch, for guess, better or worse. I guess part, part of you know, hearing these dates, we, we have Saren, we have um, Smith, you know, coming from Indiana, looking at the waterfront, having this, having this image of this idea of this memorial. But we don't have, we don't have, we, we don't have a design until 1949. We don't have the beginning of the building of the arch until 1964. Is that 62? 62. 62. What? What is it? What are the What are the things that are stalling and stopping and starting this project? And how does the National Park Service get involved? You know, when you look at the research and the history of this project, I, I for one, think it's amazing it ever got done at all. <laughs> you know, it's years and years of uh, an idea and um, contesting the idea and campaigning for the idea and championing the idea and finding um, resistors to the idea. But they had so much to deal with. First of all, it was where do they put it? But they went to Franklin Roosevelt and said, we got this great idea. How about letting us do a national park in St. Louis? He said, great. He signed it in 1935, said, good luck, tell me what you come up with, because there wasn't anything at that point to memorialize physically, it was just an idea. So they had to win over enough people to get on board with them, do the financing, get the bond issues. The huge um, interference they had with the project was the railroad, which ran on an elevated trestle the whole length of the waterfront. It took 10 years to figure out an agreement to get that um, railroad in the tunnel areas to be able to create that whole um, situation. So um, financial, political, um, logistical things to deal with. Um, they just, there was this core group that kept coming back to the fight and, and eventually they did the competition in 1947 to say, all right, we're gonna put out an all call, offer some wonderful financial rewards to architects around the country. You needed to be an American citizen to, to submit an application. And um, they said, tell us what you think we could build here and we'll take it from there and see what's submitted. So that's what started the whole process of actually trying to envision what could be built was the competition where they had um, 177 submissions and narrowed those down through a jury committee to 15. Um, and I find it really interesting that they had a, a group of architecture students who were asked to come and help with the process of unpacking and labeling and setting these things up on display. And these architectural students opened package number 144 and said, ooh, this is the winner. We like it. And they were waiting to see how the jury of seven architects would um, relate to this kind of a, a submission. Turns out they, they unanimously voted for Errol Saarinen's design, just like the kids that were helping unpack it felt. So it just hit immediate approval, and then everything went from there. And I, th I think the competition, thank goodness for the competition. Thank goodness for bringing in a mind as powerful as Errol Saarinen's to this local question that I, you know, I think the 
Jefferson National Expansion Memorial on its original sort of arc was, was sort of mired in this you know, local perfidy, this, this culture of conservatism, wanting to eke real estate profits and political victories. And Saarinen comes in and turns this into something truly breathtaking, spiritual, and international. And that is because of that competition, which local architects resisted. They thought the local architecture community could design something. And Louis Le Baume and others from the St. Louis chapter of the American Institute of Architects wanted something classical and old fashioned. And had they prevailed, we never would have built anything like the arch. There might not be any great modern architecture in St. Louis because the arch lit the fire under many other projects following that uh, project. And I think it's a great lesson that St. Louis often doesn't know what's best for itself. And this is something that replayed in the competition in 2009 when, when Van Valkenburg came to talk about his plans at a tense meeting of the American Institute of Architects, he was practically booed because he had brought in experts from outside of St. Louis to help lead the way and hadn't chosen the usual suspects of local designers and they are talented, but you know, he wanted another vision that came from the outside, but perhaps something that breathed light and air into St. Louis in a way that we are unable to do for ourselves. So these competitions, I think, have been profoundly healthy. I want to bring in a, 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 a small anecdote that, uh, yes, everyone, everyone said, yeah, Eros Aronin's design, this is, this is it. And so then the notice was sent to uh, Saarinen and Saarinen and Saarinen's uh, architectural firm, which was he and his father. Well, the person who got the note, though, was Eliel, the father, <laughs> and they began to have a celebration for the father's for the, because the father had presented a design to to the uh, to the committee as well, so they started celebrating Eliel's choice and selection, and then. So I'm curious, how many of you watched the Academy Awards where they, they announced the wrong picture as the as the picture of the year? That was exactly what that moment was: is um, getting the wrong announcement and then making the correction as soon afterwards as they could. But right. thankfully, the father was so proud of his son that he opened a second bottle of champagne. To his son's success. Right. He, did, he didn't and, pull a Kanye. Yeah. <laughs> it took it as, as best that he could, that he didn't win it, but he passed on the honor and the legacy to his own son. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Errol Saarinen was, at that point, you know, uh, speaking of being in the shadow, he was in his father's shadow and hadn't received very many large, important commissions. And this sort of propelled his career in a way that was you know, sort of tragic because he never actually saw the arch built. And uh, in fact, it slipped to the back burner in his office very soon because after the announcement of the winning the prize, he was engaged in so many other projects uh, and so much international travel um, that this became sort of a, a footnote in his mind. Um, what was part of that original design? Because obviously what what Eros Saarinen had designed was not simply the arch. He had he had a concept for the entire for the entire site. Um, can we talk about some of the things that that he had as part of that? Yeah, the competition required that the um, submissions include some central memorial, some sort of monument, um, some use of the landscape to create some um, natural setting. So he was following along with the requirements as well as the other ones were. Um, when, he, when he got to the point of designing uh, an idea, I was just fascinated by the fact that, as this um, shows with the dome, he had said, you know, studying the memorials in Washington, D.C., he realized the greatest presidents were reflected in sculptures and monuments that were domes, cubes, or a vertical line like the Washington Memorial. And so he started with the dome idea, thinking that's so much Jefferson. Monticello and U UVA, as you mentioned, were his own designs with the dome. But they wanted the airy, um, they wanted the open to represent the open space of the western continent. So they tried a pierced dome with open space. Then they tried a dome on three or two legs to support it. They ended up with pipe cleaners on the living room rug, creating an arch out of pipe cleaners and going, you know, an arch would be okay. And what I loved about Saarinen's approach is he wasn't terribly analytical. He went straight from the heart and said, you know, this looks like it might work. And so he gave a lot of credit to his engineers on his team as well and always used the word we. 
we thought it would work well. We thought it made sense. The open space that re represented the open area, the fact that the arch was a simple line like the linear um, scope of the Mississippi River and the levee. He liked how that matched. And the thing that really struck me is sometimes I think, well, what's the big deal about the arch? The big deal is it's so big. Because something like this, something like a dome, you couldn't see from miles around. They wanted something that you could recognize from a distance. And so this large, towering um, structure that rises above everything else really stirred the heart and the soul for the people that wanted to get St. Louis some recognition, you know, physically and visibly, um, besides the wonderful concept of the open space of the open west. But what I really liked was coming across in my reading that, um, to attribute another quote, um, Leonardo da Vinci said, the strength of an arch is due to its weakness. Mm -hmm. Meaning each leg would collapse on itself without the strength of both sides mm -hmm. supporting the entire structure. Mm -hmm. So when people talk about what's the symbolism, what's the story, what's the narrative about the arch, I always like to relate it to the fact that it represents the cultures and the people of the country because all the weaknesses of any of us is held together because of all of us and the strength is because we're together and that to me is a wonderful symbolism of the arch. Mm. And I think it's important to um, note that um, you know Sar Saarinen is not the only designer of the Jefferson National Expansion Memorial. We talk, we focus a lot on the arch in Saarinen, rightly so, um, but in his own words as, as Rhonda has already said, you know he always credited the entire project to the whole team and in many ways um, you know the, the project is the predominant part of this project was a landscape design that came from Dan Kiley, a very sadly underappreciated uh, modernist architect, landscape architect, who is not as famous as any either of the Serenins, um, and who survived to implement the design and change the design working with the Park Service into the 1970s after Serenin's death. So it's as much his notion of sort of letting this monument rise out of what he thought was a forested landscape or a landscape of trees that would approximate the sort of rise of a sort of civilized western expansion out of the wilderness of the west. It's a poetry, poetic metaphor. Um, and the other part of the narrative is J. Henderson Barr, a very talented delineator, drew all of the competition boards for Saren. And, and if the architecture students unpacked those boards and were wild, they were as much wild by Barr's ability to convey Saarinen's idea uh, as Saarinen's um, own design. Uh, and so this sort of process has been called, uh, defined by the architectural historian Helena Lipstadt as co-making. And so the idea of today of all these different actors coming in and remaking the arch from the park over the highway to the new museum entrance to the trails uh, is really um, very compatible with the origin and uh, evolution of the design. Mm -hmm. there, there's almost nothing that's totally, there's no sanctity to any aspect. It's always been sort of a, a moving and living thing. The process started in, what, 1928 and it's not done yet. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we have a question over here. You know, one of the things that's so interesting and challenging and rewarding um, about what we're doing now is this park revitalization, tying in the whole landscaped experience with the visual art of the memorial and then the new museum that's being constructed with the new exhibits beneath the arch. So at this point, um, we are no longer referring to it as the Museum of Western Expansion. At this point, we're tentatively calling it the Museum at the Arch 
because there are so many stories and there's so many perspectives and there's so many cultures and ethnic groups and individuals that we want to highlight. This is where I say looking back on history with the current knowledge and current research and the input from all of our neighbors in the business, it's become much more than it was in the past. So the challenge and the goal of this museum is to portray history from the multiple perspectives from all the people who were lived there, worked there, visited there, immigrated there. Um, so the, the former museum covered a timeline from the Louisiana Purchase with the great fanfare of Lewis and Clark um, going off on the Corps Discovery Expedition to the closing of the frontier. The new museum we've started much earlier. We're acknowledging the um, lives and the input of the French and Russian and Spanish explorers that were in that westward area of the continent. Um, so we're going back to the colonial St. Louis era. And then we're going all the way through the, some of the traditional history periods and pushing it up further into, into current day with the story of how the arch was built and the people that contributed that particular part of our chapter. But we're consulting with our tribal neighbors. We're doing government to government tribal um, negotiations and conversations to figure out how best to tell our stories. Um, we have our um, African American colleagues helping us with videos to portray the history of civil rights and civil injustice. We're working with a lot of people to say, we need to expand the traditional narrative with voices that have not always had a presence in things like museums and national parks and education settings. And so it'll be very interesting. You know, you talk about the, the history of the, the, um, the removal and relocation of Native people, for instance. And we have a gallery that is titled Manifest Destiny with the idea that we're not saying that was the way it is and that's the way the world looked at it. We're saying that's the way some people looked at it, that the nation was destined to overcome the rest of the continent from coast to coast. But one of our banners says, was the land stolen? Was the land traded? Was the land purchased? Can the land be claimed by anybody else who comes in and claims it for French or Spanish or um, American rulers? Mm -hmm. So this is really a neat way of facing the new way of interpreting and educating the public. We don't want to be saying we're the only ones telling the story. We're saying we want a national park to become a venue for the voices of other people and to share the story from their perspective and their knowledge. And as an example, the current exhibit that we have in the old courthouse, we hosted a visit by the Osage Nation and I said, you know what, I got my pen in hand and my tablet, I want you to tell me what we need to do differently in this, in this exhibit. And they said, well, the roach is upside down. We would never display the feather down. The feather has to be up. I said, we'll change it. We'll do a new, a new case. They said, here's the map that we're distributing from our knowledge of the Osage Nation. I said, great, we'll put it on display. So then they'll come back and do some um, professional development with our team and our staff with those kinds of um, new pieces of information, those new kinds of exhibits. So we're working that way. We're trying to go with that approach to tell the story in new ways, with new voices, um, with new exhibits, with new media, and we'll be interested to see what our neighbors and our visitors have to say when you come and visit and tell us how you think mm -hmm. it looks and how it works. Mm -hmm. I take a different view slightly, I think. <laughs> um, which I, I think that, um, you know, there's no apology for dispossession, and there's no real reparation for what was done to settle the continent. In some ways, you know, I, I, I can't always feel so sanguine about the arch because I see it as a monument to theft built on a site that was stolen. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing, but it's born from such really morally corrupt circumstances, things that we should, and I think, denounce if we are going to build real justice and real freedom in this society. Um, and I'm glad to hear the museum narratives are changing. And the title of the museum is <laughs> maybe uh, sort of reconciling itself to a new, a new future. But I, I think a lot about this in terms of the relationship of the arch to other monuments and other memorials. Um, right now, of course, we've seen the Confederate monument sacked and removed. Um, mm -hmm. I penned an editorial in the Post rejoicing. Um, and I rejoice be not because I think we should be removing historic monuments to sanitize our landscapes, because until we truly eradicate white supremacy and injustice, 
we need to be reminded of the need to keep changing society, making things right. Um, but because that monument tells a blatant lie, it uses the U.S. Constitution to justify slavery. Well, maybe that's not such a big lie, <laughs> given who founded this country, but um, the cause of the Confederacy was not the cause of the nation. And that monument tried to assert that for years. I don't think there's a way to, to really, I think any presence of that monument in a public park sanctions that message. The arch, on the other hand, has a poetic ambiguity, and I think there is a possible cultural subversion. That monument could be reclaimed by St. Louis and redefined. What it stands for is much more in the eye of the beholder. It doesn't have a naked political message, despite these founding intentions, despite what the museum may have said for years or how it depicted the interactions of European Americans with uh, the people, the first Americans. Um, just some thoughts on that. I think the other story, though, that we haven't touched on is the relationship of the arch to civil rights in St. Louis. Um, you know, the Congress for Racial Equality had a slogan in the 1960s as the arch was under construction, and that was gateway to what? I don't know if anyone's seen those, that slogan at the Civil Rights Exhibit at the History Museum. Gateway to what? What does this really stand for? When the arch was under construction, McDonald Construction Company, the general contractor, would not hire African Americans. This led to the protest in 1964, on July 14th, we're coming up to the anniversary. Uh, Percy Green and um, Richard Daly, a white activist, um, climbed the arch 125 feet. They occupied the arch for four hours in the protest of the lack of job opportunities for African Americans in St. Louis. A year before this, uh, Marion Oldham had published a study showing that the 53,000 African American uh, eligible, African Americans eligible to work in St. Louis, um, only 353 had jobs where they made $10,000 a year or more. At this time, St. Louis's priority was building these large public works projects downtown, where even the most baseline construction jobs were shut off. I mean, this even happened at Pruitt Igo, where African Americans couldn't get hired to lay brick on a housing project that would become the symbol of poverty and decay. It's like this, this story is, is a pretty sad and tortured one um, that needs to be told because it's really a story about what are the values of the city, who gets to build the monuments, and who gets to claim their symbolism. And Percy Green and others have fought to sort of create another narrative for the arch, one where the dream of freedom in the West can truly be realized. Some jobs were created after that, but it's still a struggle today when we pour $378 million in rebuilding the arch, while just this week the Board of Aldermen cut $17 million out of the city budget, a lot of that from Health and Human Services. Our civic leaders are saying, we need to fund park improvements, and people's lives are suffering. Gateway to what? You know, one of the things that I think is um, significant about what you say is the fact that, um, as I mentioned before, um, it's all about learning from history what we can do differently and do better. And I like the idea that we always hang on to the hope that we have learned and we are making progress and it's not an easy solution but we'll keep moving forward. The um, new museum has an exhibit do dedicated to the Percy Green incident um, with a picture of him and a narrative about what happened and an explanation about how the contractors then um, within days were hiring African Americans on their workforce. So you know what, there was a triumph there um, based on some activists in those days that had to take something in um, a manner in which the public would recognize. And those are the same things that's, that's happening now. You know, we have all sorts of public demonstrations that come to the courthouse steps. Mm -hmm. And they often start their demonstrations and their protests and their marches there, or they include the courthouse as part of their route. So people naturally um, gravitate towards this symbolic center of the city to have their voices be heard and have their issues be addressed and uh, um, co confront things like racial inequality and, and the kinds of things that um, has been brought up here. So um, yeah, it is a very significant place for those kinds of discussions and, there, and it is a significant place to remember the kinds of things that happened. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about the whole revitalization of the park landscape, um, it's important to understand that this is an alliance of several organizations that work together 
it's a very amazing kind of partnership between the National Park Service, the Gateway Arch Park Foundation, the Great Rivers Greenway, um, the Jefferson National Parks Association, the City of St. Louis, and most of the funding, it is a private public funded project, but most of the funding does come from um, donors who are supporting through the City Arch River Foundation the building of the, the new revitalized park and then the City Arch River Foundation has transitioned into the Gateway Arch Park to continue to solicit funds to maintain what is being built and support the kinds of things that um, are going to go on there through community engagement and um, recreation opportunities and um, concerts and fine arts and all, all the things that wrap into what the vision is for the new park. So it is a very, um, very um, intense, dynamic partnership among many different organizations of the city. What's interesting is the historical research portrays that it was always intended to be an integral part of the city and the community experience. A lot of the private funders and a lot of the um, um, business people that were behind it were supporting the commercial advantages that this kind of an operation can, can provide to uh, an urban community. The National Park Service has always been very concerned with the significance of the historical story to the national um, perspective. Together, we work on something called Jefferson National Expansion Memorial with the idea that together in all the different partnerships, we're striving for the best advantage to the greatest number of people, not just in St. Louis, but worldwide. So to have hope on where we can go and what we can do is something that a lot of people are um, holding close to, close to their hearts, saying we have learned from the past, we do recognize the things that did not go well, we're committed to seeing what we can do to help things go better in the future as a community and as a country. I think one of the, I think this also gets back to the idea of kind of the genius of, of Saarinen's design is that it can mean so many things, or it can mean nothing. <laughs> it's, it's, he's, he's created this very, very kind of, kind of, uh, freely, uh, this object that can be so, f you can f so freely associate it with so many things and such, and that perhaps allows it to go through, go through the numerous transitions that it's gone through since you its You know, and creation. one of the interesting things about comparing something like our Gateway Arch Park to other memorials around the, the country yeah. and the agency is the fact that so much of what we do is provocation, like a discussion like we're having today. It used to be thought of as direct education. We'll tell you what we know because we've done the research and we've learned the topic and we're the content experts. That idea doesn't um, hold water anymore. It's we're working together on the story. We need the input from the people who can tell the story from their perspectives. But the whole idea is to be provocative in what do these memorials mean? What does Mount Rushmore mean when you walk along the presidential trail and look at sculptures in granite? What does the Liberty Bell mean when you're in Philadelphia? What do the soldiers' huts at Valley Forge mean? What does the Gateway Arch mean? Um, sometimes situations with memorials are more evident on what they mean. And sometimes ones like the stainless steel piece of art are less demonstrative and we have to stare at it and we have to tour the museum and we have to discuss with with people what does it mean because it's not an easy one to figure out mm -hmm. but that's part of what makes it fun and that's what part of makes it interactive is we want to know what it means to you we can tell you what research shows and what the intentions were and what our mission and vision is but we want to know what it means to you mm -hmm. and I think you know all monuments are political and that means their meanings really aren't fixed because politics is sort of an agonistic process. Different parties see different things when they look at the same object. Different parties across time. You know, the activists of the 1960s saw, you know, despair at looking at the arch rising today. They might see hope because of demonstrations that have taken place there, because of, I think one of the largest assemblies I ever saw there was to greet President Obama, or Obama when he's running for president there in 2008. So uh, it takes on a, maybe a more hopeful meaning. Um, the same thing with um, other symbols and other st statues and monuments um, across St. Louis and the, the country. Um, the Confederate monument for years was seems pretty banal and then all of a sudden it was seen as odious and in need of removal. Um, I don't think we'll ever, you know, again, have the final word. Different 
generations are always going to try to read something into the arch, or as Eddie said, nothing at all. Maybe some people just see it as a, a pure work of uh, beguiling modernist sculpture. I, I think one of the fascinating things about about when when uh, the, uh, perhaps many of you have seen the the great Charles Guggenheim film that was shown in the in the Arch Museum forever still is, yeah. <laughs> and still mm -hmm. still is being shown. Probably the most seen movie in American that's history. What, that's <laughs> what I'm saying. Certainly the most screened movie in American history um, is is how it's it's this great heroic story, you know, of these of these master builders and these master planners and this, you know, those final moments when, when that arch finally comes together and they're spraying, spraying fire ho fi water from fire hoses on it so it does not begin to expand too quickly in the morning because if it does, there's no way they're gonna get that thing to hold together, right? And it's this, and it's this marvelous, marvelous heroic moment. And then of course it comes together and, and thousands and thousands of school children in St. Louis were watching this live on television and stuff as it was happening. Um, but the thing is, as, as I think Michael and I were talking about the other day, is, is that, and then it came together, and then came, what next? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because then what happens is that nothing much happens because nothing is because the thing isn't truly finished yet you know and i think there's a wonderful parallel story to this because the whole idea of the western expansion and there's free land and there's gold and oh my gosh this can solve your problems and the immigrants hoarded to st louis to get their supplies and they got to the trailheads at independence and they took the covered wagons and they went west seeking a better life there was always this fantasy that the wilderness existed forever and there was always resources to make everybody completely happy. Mm -hmm. When all of a sudden, within a hundred years, they declared the frontier had closed, the great wilderness was no longer, Americans were saying, well, now what? You know, that was part of our national identity. That was part of our purpose for being. There was always the hope of the open land out west and what I could make of myself and prov provide for my family. And all of a sudden, the story changed, and they said, we're putting a final chapter here. The frontier doesn't exist anymore. So it's kind of like this with the arch, too. All this excitement of building the arch and that big moment of, is it going to fit? Is that keystone piece going to fit? And is it going to stay together? Um, and it did. And then it was, like you said, now what? Right. So we're the now. <laughs> and right. we're the what? Uh, and you know, the future chapter is here for us to say, now what do we do with this wonderful downtown urban park and this mm -hmm. opportunity to make it part of a better city, which was always the vision, right. was this would make it a better city. And so, yeah, it's sort of a, a similar right. story. And a lot happened in those 50 years. Pardon me? That's a good idea. But we have, out of the museum title. The, the That's why I said we don't call the museum the Museum of Western Expansion anymore. Great. The 50 years, though, since our plus now that have transpired since the arch was completed, all sorts of unforeseeable things occurred. For one thing, the city lost over 55% of its population. Downtown declined and is still declining as a business center. Clayton really is downtown. Downtown's now being reborn as a residential neighborhood. St. Louis failed to build a hub airport. It went to Chicago and O'Hare, and now we have Little Spoke Airport. A lot of the prowess of St. Louis deflated, even after this great symbol rose. Mm -hmm. So the symbol didn't become the capstone to St. Louis's rebirth. Instead, it's the foundation. And we're still negotiating what kind of city can St. Louis be as a second tier city, it's never going to be first tier again. I'm sorry, it won't be. Um, that's not going to happen to Pittsburgh or Cleveland or Detroit. You know, look at it's, it's global economics that are shaping everything now, and local aspirations can't trump global economics. So the arch is a profound provocation to us today. I think to dare to dream of any world as graceful. And unexpected is that beautiful monument in those park grounds. When I first, when, I'll get to you in a minute. We're going to open this up to questions in just one one like one moment. <laughs> I'm looking for my quote. I'm oh, get it okay, get your quote. <laughs> for my moment to read the quote. <laughs> um, I'll I'll fill in while you're on your way. <laughs>
Um, when I first when I first began getting very interested in the arch, I was uh, I was uh, driving around with a uh, South African architect by the name of Joe Noero, uh, who who used to teach at Washington University, and, and I was writing an article about him for the Riverfront Times, and and Joe and I were driving along, and all of a sudden, oh, there's the arch, and I said, well, Joe, what do you have to say about the arch? And he said, it is a brilliant monument to failed ambition. <laughs> <laughs> in other words. If you construct this 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 amazing amazing structure, I mean, what the very least and most it can do is to inspire. And yet, what we saw in this city from 1965 on was indeed this um, this real devastation. This this city that became a torn thing. Um, Saarinen, as as you said, very much intended for the, for the arch to be and the and the arch grounds to be something that was for the city. He, um, I'm looking at my notes here. Um, he was looking for something that that would reinvigorate the, the the city within the forest, which he had planned for what the what the arch would come out of. From the sculpture rose, he drew trails leading to open air theaters and museums. He planned a riverside restaurant. He considered an entryway into the monument through the rock house, the old rock house, Manuel Lisa's fur trade warehouse, the oldest structure in St. Louis, thus tying together the past and the present. He intended the memorial to draw the city back to the river on whose banks it began. But more beyond the memorial grounds, he proposed a grand boulevard on what was then Third Street. A stroll along the Mississippi, he believed, could be a pleasurable as, as pleasurable as a walk beside the Seine. I wonder how many times he walked oh. along the Mississippi down here. But <laughs> this, this, this American promenade would include an arcade, shops and Riverview apartments. Special zoning ordinances would make the buildings physically more harmonious and maintain the integrity of the arch itself. Saarinen even proposed a great green space stretching from the arch to the western border of the city six miles away. The east side of the river was to be turned into a green space so that it too would become part of one great composition was Saarinen's intention. Um, obviously these, these things did not occur for all sorts of reasons. World War II happened, the Korean War happened. Um, all of these, but I would also add, none yeah. of these things met human needs. That's mm -hmm. why they didn't happen. Mm -hmm. People wanted their neighborhoods to become stable. People wanted their neighborhood mm -hmm. parks and schools to be strong. All of this is grandiosity that St. Louis didn't need. Mm -hmm. You know, I do like to hang on to the idea that where would we be without vision? And you know, these are people dreaming big dreams, and a lot of it didn't make sense, mm -hmm. and a lot of it did work, mm -hmm. but. Thankfully, we have people with vision, and we have people that can push the envelope in all sorts of areas of life and all sorts of, of conflict and, and, um, and resolution, if we're successful to get to resolution. So I like the idea that we're at a point looking at the future and what this part can be and what we've learned from the past and what our role is in it. And if I can do the quote, I, I rustle well, through quote. my bag. Mm. Um, because we have such a message here of looking at the past, evaluating the decisions of the past, figuring out what we do in the present, how we're going to um, impact the future, what our footprint is going to be. So from the park brochure, which is being uh, redesigned for the new museum and the new vision and the new park and the new landscape, this quote will remain in the new brochure by Thomas Jefferson, who said, history, by appraising the people of the past, will enable them to judge of the future. It will avail them of the experience of other times and other nations. It will qualify them as judges of the actions and judges of the designs of men. And with that, let's go to the audience and ask, take some of your questions and comments, please. Taylor has, has the microphone, and there's some right here. I just, I've got a few questions. You can decide which ones you want to answer. One is this <laughs> row of buildings behind, if you have any idea what that was intended to be. Um, second is that whole period after they demolished it, it like that's a long period that that just sat empty. Yeah, like what was the attitude lot. of St. Louisans? <laughs> I mean, what did, we, what did we think about that down there? And then um, third is the Kylie uh, collaboration. 
I'm just wondering, what was the time frame, if you know, maybe Michael, you know, about the Miller House in Columbus, Indiana, like, were they doing this at the same time that they were collaborating on this? Right. Miller House came right after this, but in that same period, they were sort of joined at the hip. And those buildings in that slide are um, just, they're fake, they're fictitious. This was, um, the city matched the ARCH project with the uh, Pacific Center Redevelopment Zone that included a special zoning that restricted height east of Broadway. There is no restriction west of Broadway. One of the common myths is St. Louis hasn't built a building taller than the arch because you can't. No, we haven't built a building taller than the arch because there's no economic sense in doing so in St. Louis. Um, but those are sort of dummy buildings showing the kind of architecture that could be built in that area just west, which was cleared and ultimately built out with a, a far more, I think, enticing, some might disagree, array of modernist buildings from the, the Pet Building up to Mansion House Center you have sort of everything from high style international, very somber buildings at Mansion House to the playful brutalism of uh, Mansion House and one of the overlooked gems of St. Louis, a little American zinc building on 4th Street at Walnut. So it's a, a lot of that did come true, that prophecy, and it wouldn't have happened without matching, you know, Saarinen's vision and Kylie's vision. One of the, one of the things about about that area um, that became a parking lot for for many many years, I I remember finding an article in the Post Dispatch and during that during that area in which they said the city was actually losing money because that war the the so-called warehouse district that there was actually tax revenue coming from that area that then was lost because well it was gone and so. They were just making money. They were just raising money out of parking. I just wanted to comment. Um, you talked about a comparison that I'm not aware of, but I did find it very interesting. This comparison, the fact that Charles Peterson, the landscape architect working for the National Park Service, came in here trying to save some of the historic treasures of that area, and. Um, in his essay in this book, The Gateway Arch, which is a wonderful collection of essays of people involved, he said, well, you know, we lost a lot of really great buildings, but thank God we saved the Rock House, the Old Cathedral, and the Old Courthouse. Mm -hmm. But he went on to Philadelphia to do the exact same task there when Philadelphia said, you know what we need to do? We need to create a big national park downtown. We've got all these buildings around Independence Hall. We've got to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. So he went out there and tried to save those buildings as they were all demolished to make way for that wonderful green space that now houses the Liberty Bell and all the open event space right. around Independence Hall. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting to me that I went from one park that, was, that went through this in Philadelphia to create a national park, and then I came to St. Louis and said, oh, it's the same story. I've seen this before. And he, he did realize the version of the architectural museum there, right? There's a, small, there's a small architectural study room at, at Independence at Hall. At Indi yeah. Independence? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where that is. I, it's there. Okay. Yeah. Very small, though. <laughs> oh, very small. Question? First, I just wanted to say thank you for the discussion. I enjoyed the, the, the different points of views being pointed out and how there is more than one story in every story that's being discussed, no matter what it is. An interesting thing I found was when I was in art school, I had a discussion, I was at Kansas City Art Institute, and had a discussion with a business person at UMKC who talked about financial history and how important financial history is to the history of art history. And he pointed out how if you follow the money through the Renaissance, you'll find out why there were so many great things that happened. And um, I think that could be very true of what was happening in the 30s in St. Louis, too, because that was also 1933 or 34 was when the Federal Housing Authority was set up and when a lot of public policy and a lot of government programs led to a lot of people taking leave of St. Louis because of cheaper loans to get housing out in the the suburbs. Mm -hmm. So that could have a major impact on what you, sir, were pointing out as the big exodus that happened in St. Louis and why were these things going on, if you guys want to touch on any of that. Well, I can, I mean, I, the 1937 was when Roosevelt administration created the Homeowners Loan Corporation, which guaranteed mortgages for the first time. Uh, I won't get into the details of that, but the Homeowners Loan Corporation, um, they um, 
promulgated maps of cities ranking districts from A to D, and they would only give guarantee mortgages in A and B ranked tracts. In St. Louis, basically everything east of Grand was C and D. Everything west of Skanker, A and B. And, right, and the Homeowners Loan Corporation, they ranked age of buildings, but also race of occupants in determining that. And Harold Ix and Roosevelt had memos on the race question, because they personally were not, they didn't consider themselves racist, but Roosevelt told Ix to keep that in because he needed the Southern Democrats and they wanted race, race, racially segregated urban policies. Yes. You know, um, there's several things that I can mention about that that I think are significant. This is something that the agency as a whole wants to see a change. You know, we want our national parks to reflect the demographics of our nation, um, especially our urban parks in certain ways when we have um, high percentages of different ethnic groups or cultural groups that seem to be our park neighbors. So we're doing lots of things. One of the things we did most recently is we um, have a, a community um, building team getting together with representatives of our, our neighborhoods to say, bring in your youth leaders and your civic organizations and let's talk about what you want to do with the park. Because sometimes it's best to say, what do you want and how can we help you fulfill that rather than us think we've got the ideas and how to attract a variety of people. So as an example, we have a lot of youth programs going on because you know it's always best to start with the young people. And um, what we have is a, a philosophy called the career ladder. And when we bring in a youth group, we say, you know what, we want to show you the potential for what you can do to become involved in this national park setting. You can start as a volunteer, as a student, as a volunteer. You can go on to become an intern. Perhaps um, you can have a seasonal position. You can perhaps go on to a permanent job. And we bring in all the different representatives of the different teams. I put on a series of hats when I meet the kids. I put on my flat hat because everyone recognizes this as a ranger on the trail. I put on the ball cap and say, look for our maintenance team. They're, they're working all around the park. I put on the hard hat and say, look what we're building, look for the hard hats. I put on the bicycle helmet. I say, look for our cops patrolling on bikes. 
These are all the things that you guys can do when you think about this as a place for your future. But start now as a student, think about it as an intern. Then the other thing we do is we invite the young people to come to our park and have it be a place of research and presentation. We had the kids from Grand um, Central Academy, we had the, the Boys and Girls Clubs come. Um, they did research on park stories like the Dred and Harriet Scott lawsuit for, for freedom from slavery. And these elementary kids came in and displayed their artwork. The high school kids came in and did spoken word at a microphone. They, they demonstrated um, creative dance. They did um, dialogue and theatrical presentations to demonstrate what they had learned from history and how they, as young people, would address the questions of racial inequality and social injustice from their eyes as a 15-year-old living in the park. You know, there's things like that that we're saying we want to be welcoming, we want to be inviting. This is the sign language uh, phrase for welcome. Welcome to our park, welcome to our landscape, welcome to the arch, welcome to share your ideas. Because as Americans, we're a melting pot where everybody is together. And that if we find a way to promote that as we stir things up, um, we have a lot of potential for having more inclusivity in our future parks and in our park positions. And I just want to add that um, I think the Park Service is doing amazing work here. It sounds fantastic, and I, I like that. But I, when I think about the le re most recent competition, I do your comment about looking around and seeing all white faces. It's like, look at who was on the board of City Arch River Foundation. Look at where the idea to remake the grounds came from, you know, white lawyers at Bryan Cave and a white mayor. And I don't think that process was inclusive at all. You know, and that's where I always like to go back to the present and say, you know, uh, history's not past tense, it's mm -hmm. present in the stories that we right. tell. And so what I always want to say is, we look at the past, we look at what happened, we look at who was in charge, and now we're going to be more inviting and more inclusive to say, that's what we don't want in the future. And there's efforts and there's, there's um, strides being made, there's a lot of work to do. but. Um, we're not going to accept what it, what it used to be like in any organization or any kind of endeavor. What we've got our eyes on is what we can do from here on into the future. So that's kind of our mantra um, to maintain the hope and maintain the vision for doing things better. I think we've got time for just this last question over here. I was just hoping you guys could, like, a lot of the depictions of the arch in, like, modern media now are, like, either of the half destruction of the arch or St. Louis is destroyed and like has been like resolved to nothing but the arch still stands. I was wondering if you guys could talk about, you know, that kind of, I don't, it's so not, like you were saying, not of St. Louis and like a future in which the arch wouldn't exist or if there's any, if there's like contingency plans for that kind of thing. You know, I remember when September 11th happened thinking like, oh, what if that happened here? That kind of, that kind of thinking and wondering how does the National Park Service look at that? Like how does that play into the narrative of, the, of monuments or the arch of, or if it's still standing? So are you asking about potential threats to the arch? Well, I know Saarinen said it was built to last a 1,000 years, so we have um, quite a bit of confidence from the engineering um, feat itself that it's probably structurally very sound. Um, it's built to withstand earthquakes and high winds. If a wind blows at 150, it's built to sway 18 inches. I've only felt it sway a little bit at a lower wind at the top, but I can tell it's moving. So in that regard, we have confidence it will be here for a long time. I personally haven't been in conversations to imagine a future without it, but that raises a very good question that um, I hadn't thought about, that could it possibly not be here someday? I haven't gone that far, and we haven't gone that far in discussion. We do have a lot of preventive um, situations and proactive in place um, for security and, and guarding um, any of our iconic monuments. The agency has named several as the icon monuments that are most heavily protected um, for the future. And it includes the Gateway Arch, the Statue of Liberty, Independence Hall, um, Mount Rushmore National Memorial. 
So um, we're glad to have that ranking to our local city park to know that we're one of the icon parks with lots of features and resources in place for um, di diligent monitoring and protection. Mm -hmm. you, you mean <laughs> your question maybe implies we're <laughs> astronauts have landed on a hostile planet and we cross the sands and meet strangers and we find a stainless steel arch coming out of the desert and we realize we've been on Earth all along. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, I, I, I do think there, I'm, all joking aside, there is a, um, I've noticed the arch in sort of a dystopian depiction occasionally. I'll, but I think, you know, generally, um, from my own sort of research and teaching, I have kind of followed a whole strain of, especially filmic media, that depicts cities as the site of catastrophe. All of our worst dystopian nightmares are supposedly lurking in the inner cities of America. Um, and I think um, monuments often provide some sort of anchor that suggests some level of permanence to something. We don't want to see society completely decay or the world completely end. So, um, you know, St. Louis was famously the, the uh, setting or the, the film, uh, filmic background for uh, Escape from New York, which doesn't feature the arts, heavily redacted from that film. Um, but, you know, in that film, the, the Statue of Liberty sort of serves as this totem, and, and the World Trade Center towers are there as well. Um, and depictions of St. Louis either dying, changing, dead, blown up, uh, run amok like Jonathan Franzen's 27th City. The arch is always there. <laughs> it's this, I think, a uh, testament to um, this sort of becomes an ancient ruin. And you see this in, in these films, Blade Runner, other films, where something of the past carries forward. And I think it's sort of our sort of, you know, projective gaze as we gaze back on monuments from antiquity like the pyramids. It's comforting to know that the world doesn't completely end. And the arch in some ways in St. Louis tells us that every morning we wake up and we see it, right? <laughs> St. Louis is still here. And, uh, and I will say that the very first time I visited the Arch was when I first moved to St. Louis in 1993, which was the time of the, of the Great Flood. And, and I made my first two trips to, to Fair St. Louis. And one night, uh, the first night I went, Dolly Parton performed, and the next night James Brown performed. And I thought I'd come to the greatest place on earth. <laughs> That's my greatest memory. Of, uh, I want to let you all know that there, there's a terrific book on Aero Saarinen in our bookshop um, today. It's by um, uh, Jane Merkel. Uh, it's beautifully illustrated, and so you might, you might want to check that out. I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank our guests, and uh, go visit the Arch. <laughs> yes, and I would like to extend a very friendly invitation to do that. I've got some handouts here for you and some cards if you'd like them um, before you leave today, but I definitely want to say come back and give the park a visit, walk on the trails, walk along the new renovated riverfront, um, sit down by the reflecting pond, go check out the new North Gateway, enjoy Keener Plaza across the street, the park across the highway. Um, we're planning on having the new museum fully open next summer with all the new galleries that share history from new perspectives. So please make this a point in your future to come back and give us a visit if you'd like to volunteer. If you'd like to participate, let me know, and we'll find a place to help you um, feel like you're participating in ways you might want to. And I would encourage everyone to take a look at the arts from unexpected places as well. Um, we did the show of hands. I won't do that again, but cross the Eads Bridge on foot and see it from the middle of the river. Go over and see the overlook, which is, you know, we, we City Arch River didn't put anything on the other side of the river, but other efforts have led to the construction of a fountain and an overlook. And that view of the arch in St. Louis I might wrinkle you out of whatever nagging um, complaints and critiques we've laid out today. Uh, yeah. It's quite beautiful from that side. North St. Louis, all the streets of the north side on the river hit the arch at these strange angles. Santa Crown Candy Kitchen, look down 14th Street. And you're going to think you're in a beautiful, big, bustling city. The arch takes on a whole different meaning than wherever you go throughout the region, but I encourage you to spot the arch <laughs> and look at what frames it and look at those relationships because it, it, it is indelibly now the center of St. Louis.
Kirkwood, the Merrimack. I know that spot. <laughs> and you yeah. can see it from the south. You can see it as you come yeah. in and out of Jefferson Barracks or down on the Jefferson Barracks Bridge. I mean, it's a beacon. I grew up in Columbia, Illinois, and I could see it at night from over there, reminding me there's a big city next to it, pulling me out of my little rural slumber. <laughs> 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 well, anyway. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mike. No problem.